So first and foremost, the, this presentation um, kind of got generated out of the whole concept that, you know, we have a we have a lot of literature now that says that we can leave peripheral IV catheters in, um, but I, I was really kind of thrown by some of the information that's been coming out lately, and how much how many catheters don't ever make it to that endpoint. Whether you've got a rotation policy of 72 hours or when clinically indicated, we're losing a lot of them really early. So I, I guess I got motivated to do this presentation based on that. And full disclosure, I do work for BD as a clinical marketing manager. I've been there about 15 years. And prior to that, I spent a lot of time in clinical practice on infusion teams and home, in, home infusion care. Started my career at MD Anderson in Houston and uh, really feel very fortunate that I actually worked for the first nurse that ever placed a PICC line in the United States. So um, that's kind of my claim to fame, you know. Uh, spent a lot of time with PICs and central lines and so forth, but the last 15 years, as BD is a manufacturer of peripherals, I've loaned, known, grown to love and admire and respect peripheral IV catheters. So I won't be talking about any off-label use. I need to clarify that. My objectives are really just to kind of Talk about the current literature that we have today that uh, we look to for guidance. Talk a little bit about our current practice uh, that we see in, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of what we see in the U.S. And then describe some of the strategies that we know exist. And then talk a little bit about why we're not seeing you know, better uptake of those strategies. Um, I, those of you, how many have seen this article? Have you all seen this article? So I can't, I have to start by saying in my long history, I won't tell you how many years, in infusion practice, I've read a lot of articles. And I have to tell you that I don't think I've ever been quite as blown away. I was running down the hall carrying on screaming when I read this one. Because it was, I've never read anything so comprehensive, uh, really a great overview of the practice of peripheral IVs and the current state of that. Very well, I think it's over 160 references. Uh, so it was a literature review. So it wasn't a study, it was just a really comprehensive literature review. And you can find a lot of articles on phlebitis, and you can find a lot of articles in infiltration and in you know, all these different patient groups. But to have it so comprehensively put together, I've never seen anything like it. And the first thing I said to myself is, who is Bob Helm? Never even heard of this guy. How do I not know Bob Helm? if he's writing such an incredible article as long as I've been in this industry. I didn't know anybody else on the list either, which is really disturbing. So I called him up. I said, who are you anyway? You know? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, movie, the Sundance, uh, what was that crazy thing with uh, Robert Redford in them? But they're, they're chasing him through the desert and he keeps looking back and they just keep gaining on him. Who are those guys? <laughs> you know, it was a great line in that movie. So I felt like that. And I uh, actually called Dr. Helm and talked to him. And just a little background since we um, have a little extra time tonight. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon. He's probably never put a peripheral IV in his life in. And uh, I didn't really get past him, so I don't know the rest of the people on the list. They don't even all work in the same facility. So, um, but he was a cardiothoracic, he is a cardiothoracic surgeon up in a little hospital in Maine. And uh, came out to visit one of his patients one day in the priest post-op. And the patient had a jugular dressing, you know, over a jugular catheter and the dressing. And, you know, it was all loose, of course, wasn't adhered. And, you know, slobber was running down into it. And he called the nurse office, you got to change this dressing, you know. I, mean, I just saved this guy's life with cardiothoracic surgery and he's going to die from an infection. She said, I just changed it five minutes ago, you know. So he got all excited. And then he does own a couple of patents. Uh, you know, has issued a couple of them. So I think he's a little bit of a frustrated engineer. But he just said, I just got really interested in looking into it, you know, and trying to figure out what in the heck is going on. So uh, highly recommend the article if you haven't read it. And a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is data that he did the literature review and, and searched for. So it's nothing like that I did all this, so I just <laughs> want to play that. Uh, and I do think such a timely uh, and I love this, the uh, title of this. I mean, it's just everybody gets an IV, and it's just an IV, and they really don't get any respect. I feel like Roger was in danger field. He's like, get no respect, you know? And I, I thought, he said it so well. It's accepted all over the place, but, you know, it really should be unacceptable. 
And so, but I do think things are changing. And I think this article, as well as a lot of other information, is shifting. And, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of our time over the last decade in focusing on the central lines and improving that. And we've demonstrated that we can do it. You know, as a team, we've changed our practices, we've implemented new technology, and we have demonstrated very effectively that as a team and as a joint effort, we could make improvements for patients. And uh, when I worked at MD Anderson uh, a long time ago, I remember um, telling patients that, you know, what the risk of them getting an infection from their line was. And here we were at a time, uh, again, a long time ago, when breast cancer patients, um, you know, died frequently from breast cancer, from their disease. Today, breast cancer is fairly curable. I mean, you know, if you catch it early, you've got a really good chance. I know a lot of survivors. And yet, we still have patients dying from central line bloodstream infections. That's pretty incredible to me. And it's always kind of been an early experience that I had that it drove me that here this poor patient was dealing with their breast cancer and I'm sitting there telling them that this catheter I'm getting ready to put in their arm is possibly going to kill them. And I, I can remember that a long time ago, but feeling that way that, and it really drove my passion. So I hope by the end of this lecture, my, my real purpose for this lecture is to try to instill some of that passion around peripheral IVs and uh, talk about why I think we should have the passion about that and then some of the things that maybe we can do together. So his article does a good job of talking about the current state. Uh, we know that, sorry, I forgot to turn this. So we know that the INS standards uh, have recently, in the last several years, been changed thanks to the avatar work and uh, Claire's group and, and so forth. And it, it's really funny because we've just accepted that as a standard of practice and everybody thought it was. And I can remember 20 years ago lecturing and saying that site rotation was important because it eliminated phlebitis and, it, you know, if, they, if you took the IV out on a routine basis and moved it to another site, then you reduce that risk of uh, phlebitis or infection. Uh, I mean, I remember <laughs> teaching that, you know, and being supportive of that. I don't know that I ever really did the research to figure out where that standard came from. So bad, you know, my bad. And uh, so I tell people all the time now, just because it's written in some document, you really need to understand where that came from and uh, dig a little deeper. So I learned my own lesson that way. And now we have a recommendation, at least out of INS, and some ch language change in the CDC that promotes and uh, recommends that there's no need to just routinely pull an IV. You know, that, that doesn't make any sense. It's working and it's well secured and it's uh, doing the job it was designed to do. Uh, that there's no evidence that phlebitis or infection, which is what uh, Claire's work demonstrated, uh, were not any higher. Whether you left it in until something happened or they didn't need it anymore, or if you took it out at 72 hours. You know, she demonstrated that very well with that large randomized trial. So, you know, based on that evidence, though, the most important important thing, in my opinion, that came out of this, uh, this article and this work was all the other um, information that we I discovered. So yeah, we demonstrated that phlebitis and infection weren't any worse and that we could leave the IV in longer. The big thing was that they weren't making it anyway, so it really didn't matter. So when uh, Bob Helm did his research and found out that 35 to 50, it definitely correlated with what Claire's work had already demonstrated. So I think over the last, you know, two or three years now, we've just had an incredible amount of awareness generated that peripheral IVs are failing early. Now, I, I need to clarify, because I work for a catheter company, I don't think the catheters are necessarily <laughs> failing us, and, uh, but I do think the way we manage them, insert them and manage them, we're failing. So as clinicians, I think we're failing to keep those IV catheters in uh, to where we, you know, can expect them to do the job that we put them in. And I do like this quote from the Helm article, and I, I mentioned that, you know, even when we go and look for data around infection, it's very low. It seems very low related to peripheral IVs. But I think his point is that, you know, we call it phlebitis or we call it infiltration. And then they're probably very much uh, related to infection. 
So we may not have catheter loads documented on the catheter tip, but I'm sure that there is a precursor anyway uh, related to infection. And if one of the challenges and people are concerned is if we leave these devices in, uh, you know, will we have increased risk of infection? However, the point is, is that if they have these complications, then they have to be removed. So it's not saying you can leave the IV in until the patient's arm falls off. It's leave the IV in as long as it's working well and secured well, et cetera. So these are the rates that, uh, you know, kind of a summary of the rates that uh, Dr. Helm put out in his article. And, you know, the, these rates are just, when you read these, you just kind of go, you've got to be kidding me. You know, what else would we have ever accept this kind of rates in medicine for? And it's not, uh, phlebitis and infiltration and infection are important, but as Claire's pointed out many times, it's not even the real biggest problem. You know, they're occluding they're, or tissueing or whatever, you know, infiltration, uh, mechanical failures. And then we got a good 10% of them in her study anyway, just falling out on the floor. I mean, that's pretty sad. And um, I, I just, you know, I think that so critical to this information is getting it out there and helping people understand that this is happening. So, um, you know, take the complications themselves and the, and the poor patient that's experiencing those. If you just want to look at the economic impact, it can be incredible. So this is just an average hospital, 250 IVs they buy every year. If a third of those, you know, 30% of those are not making it, not doing the job and having to be restarted, you wouldn't have to make much of an improvement in that at about $30 a restart, and that's nursing time and supplies. And that's a, probably a conservative estimate, to be very honest. Uh, you wouldn't have to make a huge improvement in that number to really see some financial benefit. So I think people think, oh, it's another IV, and so we'll just stick them again, and you know. But when you start adding up all of that, just from a financial standpoint, uh, an economic standpoint, it doesn't take long to figure out that this is a great deal of money that's being spent uh, managing IVs. And then just most recently, right here from Australia, and I don't know, hopefully, does anybody know these people? <laughs> Do you? Oh, good. Well, great. I didn't ever hear it. I just ran across this the other day. And this was a great article. I mean, it was a small little, you know, randomized, I mean, um, small group of patients were interviewed in a small cancer facility. And I think it was 15 patients in a rural, where about says this? Does anybody know? It's where? Fulton Court. Ah, okay. And I just thought, I read this, and I thought, this is so fascinating. Because we look at it from these complication rates and so forth, and we talk about the economics of it, but we really haven't ever investigated how the poor patients feel about all this. Now, true, this was an oncology setting, and they're having to come in repeatedly for, you know, chemotherapy and so forth. But I thought it was interesting, and the way they went about the survey, and this was kind of their opening questions, you know, we're just kind of setting the stage, we want to understand what cannulation was like for you, and, you know, what was your experience like? And it kind of led, as they did it, to four major things. One of these was, you know, it's just a necessary evil. It's just what I got to go through. And that, you know, they were more worried about the cannulation and more anxious about that than they were getting their chemotherapy, they, these poisons that were putting in people's bodies to kill, you know, the cancer. And they also didn't think, like, we spent a lot of time educating patients about the treatment and so forth. But it, hardly anybody told me about what it was going to feel like to have that sharp needle stuck in my hand and that burning sensation while I was getting the drug. So they didn't feel like that they were being very well educated about that kind of experience for them. And that each one of their, you know, every week they came in, they had more anxiety about it and their anxiety level went up. And then I thought it was several of them and it said they considered abandoning their treatment due to the pain and trauma of the cannulation, which is just kind of just blows your mind that you know, I've got to have this treatment <laughs> to ever have a chance of living, and I would give it up because of an IV stick. You know, it, it's mind-boggling in my opinion. The second thing they talked about was that, you know, as they reflected back over the time that they'd spent getting IVs, that, the, you know, the only thing that helped them was sharing their experiences with other patients. And they'd all sit around and say, oh, 
Sam had to stick me 10 times last week, and Jim had to stick me four times, and ask, be sure to ask for Amanda, you know. I mean, it was this camaraderie that they built around their IV experience, not necessarily their treatment or cancer therapy. And then the last one, which I, you know, just kind of breaks my heart when you read these quotes, it just tears your heart out. But they felt that it was their fault. Oh, I got bad veins. Did you drink all the water I told you to drink, Sam? You know, I mean, they almost made it sound like it was the patient's fault. So they went away feeling guilty, <laughs> you know, that they had bad veins. And that just tears me up inside. I, maybe it's because I'm old and I'll probably end up with cancer and, you know, <laughs> need to get this. But it just was mind-boggling to me. And then the other thing, they talked to them about, you know, did they have any suggestions? And I was, they thought we ought to practice on each other. They said, if you really experienced this yourselves, you would know how horrible this is, and you would, be, you know, do it different. Pardon me? <laughs> right. So I think, you know, from strictly the data alone, we've got documented evidence of how, you know, these failures are happening and these early uh, removals are happening. We've got economic information that says, you know, this is costing us a lot of money. And now we're starting to see things like this, this patient experience being more, more documented. So I think, you know, the question kind of comes to what can we do? And whose job is it? Who, who really owns this? And I think the challenge with peripheral IVs is that every patient gets one in every department in the hospital. You know, <coughs> I think there's a... The current estimate in the U.S. is that 95% to 96% of patients that walk in the front door of a hospital get an IV catheter for either diagnostic or, or treatment purposes. Now, they may end up with a central line later on, but they all end up with, they have an IV first thing. And it's everywhere in the hospital, you know, every department. You can't single out hardly one that doesn't stick somebody, you know. And so it's so massive, I think that that's the other reason that we don't think about what we can do about it. So, and then of course there's the how. We need to study different interventions and ways of accomplishing improvement. But for the most part, you know, we, we have all this information and I, I'm gonna share with you some personal information that from a BD standpoint, we help customers look at their practice because it's not very well documented. You know, ideally, in our fancy EMRs today, uh, electronic medical records, you'd be able to push a button and know how many IV catheters a patient had and how long they were in and why they came out. And it should be easy. We have all this, you know, beautiful medical record now. I want to tell you, it's worse now. I'll just <laughs> give you an example. When I was in clinical practice, there was a flow sheet. Every IV for that patient was on that flow sheet. So you wanted to know what was going on with IVs, you went to that flow sheet. Now in the EMR, it's a whole new ball game. You got to, well, he came in the ER at 7 a.m. and he got an IV, and then you got to track hour by hour by hour by hour through the, log to, through the electronic record to find out if the IV ever got pulled out, what happened to it or anything. It's a nightmare. So how much EMR do you have here yet? Do you have a lot? Is it starting to really? I well, any of you that can get involved in <laughs> implementing EMRs, figure out a way to have a place where you can document IV because it's a nightmare where we have it. Uh, these, are, these are assessments that we've done over the last couple of years uh, just to try to help hospitals understand what their data is. You know, we can bring Claire's data in, we can bring the Helm article in, but until they make it their own, and, you know, it, they just don't believe it. You know, oh, yeah, thanks for dropping that article off. But, you know, I, I'm sure ours isn't that bad. So you really have to help customers, uh, you know, from our perspective, understand what their issues are before they're going to be open to any kind of uh, solutions. So just over the last, uh, c you know, several years, we've been into about eight accounts that, you know, I'm sharing this summarized data. So we looked at over 1,000 sites. That means we just walked around and looked at IV sites and we had a list of things that we considered risks, whether the dressing was dated or not, if there was blood under the dressing, if there was dressing was loose or not, uh, that kind of, was it in the right site, you know, was it placed properly, et cetera. 
And so out of that, you know, 1,100 patients that we looked at, we had about 1,500 risks identified, which were right there. We also went and started doing chart reviews. And again, this is a laborious process of going through that. So we can't, it's hard to do too many, you know, but you ask to see so many charts that were discharged in the last 30 days and, you know, you just start picking through them and try to find out how many IVs the patient had and for how long and so forth. Well, first and foremost, you need to know out of these eight hospitals that we did, out of 345 medical records, 53% of them did not have any documentation about the IV. Maybe it went in, but they all got left there because apparently they never got removed because there's no data. How many times did it take somebody to get the IV in? That's not there. It's just not there. So documentation alone is just hard. So you're never going to know if you have a problem if you don't document it, right? So that in and of itself is eye-opening. Uh, but out of those 345 that we did get data out of, about 22% were removed for some routine reason, meaning the patient was discharged or it was, they had a site rotation policy and they removed it due to that site rotation policy. Uh, you know, the patient didn't need it anymore or whatever. So only 22%. 25%, very much in line with all the other data we're seeing, were removed for some reason that required early removal and a restart. At least that was what was documented. And then these are the symptoms, you know, whether they were symptomatic, meaning it's red and swelling, whether it was occluded, it fell out, and so forth. So it's interesting that even on this account by account level, it's matching up totally with what is being written in the really good randomized trials that are looking at that. So, so what do we do? <laughs> You know, come back to my questions, you know, what should we do? So now it's kind of the how. Um, you know, not only the, here's the problem, and I, I think to me that's part of the problem because we don't believe it's a problem or it's not recognized as a problem or we don't want to admit it's a problem. <laughs> I think it's a combination of all of those things. But, you know, uh, how do we improve? We know we have data right now. We, it's not like we need to invent some new catheter or some new machine or some new dressing. You know, I think we have good products. Um, my buddy over in uh, New Jersey, Matt Ostroff, he says, you know, the manufacturers are building good cars. He's got a picture of a Lamborghini on his slide. He said, but we don't really have very good drivers. You know. So we have this real gap in knowledge and experience and training uh, for the people that are managing all of those. So I think that these are things that we need to look at, uh, but at the same time we need to figure out how we can get the masses to be as knowledgeable as those of us that have been uh, participating in this. And I believe, like oh, I think a lot of people do, I'm sure these people do, that without the data, without some real strong evidence, people are just not going to move. And I will tell you that that data I just showed you, in every one of those eight hospitals, when you sat down across from the DON and told them that 30 to 40 percent of their IVs, well, first of all, 50 percent aren't documented. That would get their attention. And 30 to 40 percent are failing early, and it's costing your institution about, you know, half a million dollars a year. That got some attention because it was their data. So I think that part of the problem is we don't have enough in-your-face data to be very personalized. You know, when we all got on the bandwagon to lower bloodstream infections related to central lines, what, do you, what drove that? People dying, it was on the front page of newspapers, right? Patients are dying due to bloodstream infections that they get in the hospital when the doctor hangs his tie in the field. So it became very obvious that what was happening and it, it, it drove a lot of change. In the US now, they get an infection on the central line, they don't get paid to take care of that patient. So it's now driven to a whole new, you know, there's a whole new driver. The almighty dollar is now driving uh, a lot of the changes. So, and the other thing is, this doesn't have to be really big scientific data. I mean, this is, you know, I spent a half a day looking at some charts. And I walked around in the floors and looked at the IV, the IV. They're just little random point prevalence, you know, just taking a quick look at what's going on today. And OMG did this, you know, they, that was a start. Let's look at what's really going on with IVs around the world. So 
I think, while OMG, I'm very supportive and it was exciting, I got to get every hospital, you got to get every hospital to look at their own data and suggest that, hey, this is a serious problem. I should do something about this. And I do think we need to make it more personal for the patient. You know, the patients right now just accept it. They think it's okay, you know? So, but I, I don't know if you guys have the uh, patient satisfaction surveys that randomly go out after patients have discharged. So those are starting to make a big impact. You know why? Because the federal government said that if your patient experience scores are down here, you're not gonna get as much money. So they've basically taken this 25%, lower 25%. When you fall into that low category for patient satisfaction and complications that occur while that patient, readmissions, there are several things in there. But then you just don't get as much money. So they take the money they would normally give that 25% of hospitals and give it to the top tier hospitals. So there's definitely um, you know, some motivation, both financial as well as patients are starting to become much more aware of the issues. So if we can measure, uh, the other reason to have this data, of course, is because we implement things all the time. And we have no way to know whether they're any better or worse than what we had before. I mean, every category of products I could sit here and name, dressings, needless connectors, new IV catheter, new filter, new something. Uh, the latest one is the caps that go on the cap. W they buy them and they start using them because they read a paper and said, oh, this works, you know. But they don't have any way to judge whether it works in their own hospital because they don't have the data to, su to support it. So somebody strong in the organization, infection control or quality or the IV team or whoever, they go and talk them into buying those things. And they put them in and everybody thinks everything's hunky-dory. They've met that, they've checked that box off, they got that fixed. Well, maybe not. If they're not tracking it, how do you know? So I, I, you're shaking your heads. I hope you agree with me about this. It's certainly what we see in the US. Um, and there, of course, patient satisfaction, you know, the patient satisfaction surveys that we do do, you know, they say something like, uh, it's not really about the IV experience. It's something about your sticks or something like that. But more and more hospitals are starting to dive a little bit deeper into that and understand it more. Right now, uh, good, another good example related to central lines is occlusion. So most people don't have any idea what their occlusion rates are. They, they might know how much, you know, TPA they buy, and that's about all they know. So they buy fancy connectors and they buy fancy catheters and all this that are supposed to reduce occlusions, but they don't really have any way to determine whether that's really effective or not. So decre decreasing supply costs and so forth is going to have to be connected to being able to measure your impact with that investment. So my buddy Matt over in New Jersey that I talked about, and I'm sure you're going to be hearing more from this guy. He's kind of a, I, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, he's, he's this young, you know, good looking kid. Well, he's not a kid. I shouldn't say that. He was in his 40s. The guy had an interesting career. He was a soap opera star. And uh, he, got tired of that and didn't feel like he was making a big impact. So he went to work as an EM, well, an EMT, I think. The first day on the job was 9-11 in New York. So he had quite the induction into that. Ended up being an ER nurse in the ER, and that's where he kind of fell in love with vascular access. And he just, I think, I, I can't remember exactly when I met him, but it was, you know, four or five years ago, and he just, all of a sudden, it was like somebody turned a switch and he finally found his calling. And he is just an incredible presenter, so passionate, and I think just soap opera acting style that makes him so fun to watch. But he is just a natural in front of people, you know. He, he did a presentation at Ava, was it last year or the year before where he came out in a patient gown? That was all, he, just the patient gown. And so he had everybody's attention. <laughs> and, but anyway, he, he's been searching around, he's worked a couple places, and he finally found this hospital in New Jersey who didn't have any kind of infusion team at all. And uh, you know, the radiology was putting all the picks in, or the few picks that they put in. But it's a big hospital, 700 beds. 
And he said, you know, he finally found the right guy. I think he was the head of surgery or somebody. He hired him. He said, let me be the vascular access person for a year. And let me show you what I can do. Buy me an ultrasound and put me in there and let me do my thing and I'll demonstrate my work. And he's done it. But one of the things that he did find that a lot of the picks that he was being called to put in, and he estimates something like 40%, were being called because the patient was a difficult access. Have you heard the diva term? You know, we're using that all the time, diva. So he just kept saying, well, you know, he'd go, he'd go to the floor and they'd say, yeah, I've, I've stuck the patient three times. I can't get in, you know, got an order to put a pick in. He said, well, does the patient need a pick? Well, I, we can't get a peripheral in, you know. So he would take the ultrasound in there. He would evaluate the patient. He would look at the order. The patient needed two or three more days of IVs. This patient doesn't need a pick. You know, it's cephalus born, it's going to, you know, be fine. But they've been sticking the poor guy, and, you know. So he got his ultrasound machine, put a peripheral in, and it lasted, and he got it through. So he started really doing that and encouraging people to not call the doctor immediately and get an order for a pick. Just call me, and I'll come, and we'll look at the patient. If he really needs a pick, we'll get an order for the pick. The other story he tells that's so funny is he'll go up there, because they called him, and they said, we need your help, start the IV. And they'll come in with a bucket full of catheters. And he says, what are all those for? Well, you're going to, you know, he's a difficult stick. He said, I, I only need one catheter. How many catheters do you need? <laughs> you know, how many lines do you want? Just one. Well, I don't need all those, you know, but people are so in tune to just bringing all those catheters. They're setting themselves up to fail, you know. So anyway, he, as you can see his numbers here, he's really making a, a difference and a change in how much, what lines he's needing and so forth. And with the pressure in the U.S. anyway to really drive uh, the use of central lines down, when you, especially when you don't need them, then he's really making a big impact. He's uh, managed to get three more staff members in the last year, and he's gotten a little bit of uh, relief. But he's, uh, he's an incredible guy that if you ever get to hear uh, speak, has really demonstrated that he can do this. Here's some other data that he shared with me. So without the ultrasound, most 20% were in the hand, 16 were in the wrist, 29 in the antecubital, and only 33% in the forearm. When he started using vascular access and putting them in, he got only 11% in the antecubital, 65% in the forearm, 24% uh, up in the upper arm. Whoops, sorry. So, and none down the wrist and the hand. So, I, I think telling about this is that <coughs> we, we have a standards of practice that say you shouldn't put IVs in the hand and you shouldn't put them in the antecubital, areas of flexion and so forth. And we have good data now that suggests what a, how much that increases the risk of failure. Yet we still keep putting them in there. But I ask myself, why do you think they do? Well, that's the vein they can see. That's the vein they can feel. So if we really want nurses to start putting IVs in the forearm, we're going to have to figure out some technology to help them get them in. Right? I mean, they're, they're, the veins in the forearm aren't easy necessarily just popping up there. We also need longer catheters especially with their obese population, because if we go in the upper arm or even the obese population, a one-inch catheter isn't big enough. You know, you're not going to get enough vein purchase in order to keep that line in. Uh, so, and he's just, you know, incredible what he can demonstrate to you, because he's evaluated that vein and the depth of that vein before he ever stakes. So he knows, well, I'm going to need a longer catheter, or I'm going to, you know, have to really watch how much I can get in the vein and so forth. So this is kind of information that's going to have to change. That's Matt right there and his cohort there. And then Dr. Helm really spends a little bit of time in his article talking about the, the fact that we place peripheral IVs in the clean technique that we use. And uh, he goes through this elaborate process and they're talking about that all the external surfaces are contaminated. And while we proved that peripheral IVs didn't necessarily have more infection if you left them in longer. We also know that that could happen if we do leave them in longer because we have a contaminated product put in the patient from the very beginning. And then we go to all that effort to put that sterile dressing on there. So his pushing really hard to help us understand uh, the value and consider how we continue to treat IVs and how do we insert them. 
So the other thing is we touch things in the room while we're, before we're putting it in and then also after. So if we're using technology that doesn't control the blood and we get blood on our gloves, we think we're all fine and dandy because we have these great gloves on from the box on the wall. And then we touch something. We turn the pump on, we pull the bed rail up, and then we take those gloves off. Now, it might have been just a little bit of blood, but we've now potentially contaminated other things in that room. So that brings the discussion around sterile barrier and whatnot, and then the uh, current INS standards, and then the new version that I've read the preview of. <coughs> They're recommending maximum sterile barrier for midlines. And you know, spitting a promise for pit fear off live AIDS. What's the difference really, you know? Do we really think the bacteria know which kind of line they have, you know? Uh, so I, I just think we're gonna have to continue to challenge ourselves about this now if we really want any of this to change. It's not gonna change because somebody builds some fancy new peripheral IV, I don't think. I mean, it may be part of it. There's certainly some opportunity for technology. But a lot of this, we have to challenge ourselves about how we treat these devices. So the dressings. You know, most of the IV start packs that I see have that little dressing that's about this big, you know, that would really hardly cover anything, much less keep anything secure and from not moving. So I do think that, you know, there's a lot of room for new technology, but it's going to cost a little bit more. You know, and we're going to have to be willing to pay for that as clinicians and as, in, as institutions. Um, we've had standards of recommendations to use securement devices on all devices for years now. Why do we not use them on peripherals? Why do you think? Cost, right? But it's also because I don't know the impact of not using it. I don't, I don't nobody's told me that my IVs are falling out 10% of the time. So why would I consider buying something that costs $5 to do something, to fix something that I don't know I got a problem with? So it really all comes <laughs> back down to that. You know, do we need antimicrobial dressings on peripheral IVs? What kind of prep should we be using before we start those IVs? So these are all things, I don't have all the answers to these, but I think that these are things that we'll have to consider. You know, I'm a big believer in closed IV catheter systems. The less things that you have to touch during that insertion, the better. Right now, with regular open, non-integrated systems, you have to handle that catheter and you have to attach that extension set before you can create a sterile barrier over it. I think closed systems help uh, manage that. I did this just the other day out of my own interest. Let me see if I know how to make this work. <coughs> this is a fake arm, it's not a real person. But I was trying to see, could I put that catheter in and not touch it? And if I reach over and I just get a two by two, and I lay it over there, that two by two hopefully sterile, and I have that dressing sitting right there, I can put a cover over that insertion site and then do all the other things that I need to do. And that's the closest thing that I've been able to see where we could actually put a peripheral catheter in and it be as close to sterile as possible before we lay it down and put a dressing over it. <coughs> Disinfection of the, you know, Scrub the hub, I mean, how long have we been saying scrub the hub, scrub the hub, scrub the hub? How long, what with? I mean, we've been debating all this, but we can't get people to do it anyway. So what? do something to it, you know? And I do think that part of it is just, uh, they're not, you know, I, I, we were talking about this from the car over, is it apathy? Is it no time? Is it lack of understanding and education? Or is it that they don't understand the impact of them not doing that? So it's not in their face that the IV is getting infected, so they don't think there's anything wrong in not scrubbing the hub. But if every one of those patients that they didn't do that got an infection, they would change that practice. But right now they don't know. So we continue to try to build things and make it easier for them and you know so forth. And I think 
you know, BDs co-packaging their alcohol with their, at least they have to consciously say, I'm going to throw this away <laughs> and not use it, you know, if it's right there with the syringe at least. Um, you know, and I, and I think there's plenty of opportunities for more technology that can drive compliance. Uh, the sites, these little caps that are coming around, you know, it, it's a brilliant idea. Hey, keep it covered. That would make sense. However, they're very expensive. So they don't incorporate them everywhere, you know. Well, because they're so expensive, we're only going to put them on our central lines. Or we're only going to put them on the primary part. We're not going to put them up on the side ports on the line. Well, that just makes no sense. Why would you spend that much money and only put it in halfway? You know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So if we are going to develop this technology and we're going to accept the other thing, we incorporate these into the practice, but we have no way to know whether it made a difference or not, especially on peripheral IVs because they're not tracking. So as this technology continues to come around and, and so forth, then we have to consider how we're going to use it. So sort of my call to action on this is, you know, who really is, owns this? Who owns this problem? What do you think? Who do you think owns it? <laughs> Vascular access specialists own this. It, there's nobody else in the hospital that cares about this. So if there's ever going to be a change, somehow collectively as a specialty, which we keep saying we want to be, right? We want to be a specialty. We have board certification now and we have, you know, but we're not using it to our full extent. We're not owning this problem. And I, I know I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are busy pick light inserters and they kill themselves every day running around <laughs> putting picks in. And, you know, they, they're dragging home at the end of the day, you know, about 30 picks in today, and they're just dying. <laughs> and right as they're walking out the door, some nurse from ICU calls and said, I've stuck this patient four times, six times. I need your help. And you're just going, oh, my God, I can't start another IV today, you know. And so part of it is that we, I, I see anyway with our pick teams, sorry, I messed that up. Uh, I see with our PIC teams, they are so overwhelmed and so busy trying to manage that. And now they're taking on, you know, regular central line insertions, jugulars and subclavians, and they're going to all these advanced practice courses that the great Teleflex people in here are offering around the world. Uh, you know, they're all, and it's great. I mean, it's wonderful. I'm very supportive of that. But we've got a lot of people out there getting stuck with vascular access devices that are getting poor care. And somehow we have to figure out a way to improve that. We have to own that because nobody else in the hospital is going to own this. And it has to be more than say, okay, I'm going to take a new dressing over to the vascular access committee and recommend that. It, it can't just be that. We have to somehow figure out a way to fill this gap between this poor, uneducated, overworked staff nurse and us overworked, you know, pick nurses up here and fill that gap. We have to at least get, drive some kind of uh, use of interventions that we know exist. How many of you work in hospitals? <coughs> I know there's not, uh, well, in the US, I'll just say this, because I know this. There is hardly any vascular access specialist in the hospital today that can tell me why they don't use uh, some kind of securement on peripheral IVs. They don't know. They don't even know they're not using it. <laughs> they don't know the data or anything. So if nothing else, as vascular access specialists, we should start getting the data. And it doesn't take much time. It's easily there. I mean, you can get it. But you got to get somebody's attention to this. And maybe rather than saying, hey, I need another pick nurse because I put in 30 you know, a day and I'm dying, Maybe I need to say, hey, I really need some extra staff because look at all these peripheral IVs that are going in and are failing early and it's costing me this much money. You give me a new vascular access specialist that can help improve this outcome, 
you know, I, I can save you enough money to pay for that person. And then we're really making a big difference. I don't know the numbers worldwide, but in the U.S., we sell, not we, BD, but in, in the country, we buy about 7 million central lines. That's PICs and hemodialysis catheters and all kinds of central lines. Anybody have a guess about how many peripheral IVs we sell or we buy? Mm -hmm. hmm? 330 million. So we've had a lot of attention, a lot of interventions, a lot of great things happening around this 7 million catheters, and we've made big improvements. But we have purchasingly ignored 330 million. And I promise you there will be nobody else that cares about this except vascular access specialists. And those of us that work for industry have to do talks like this to encourage people to care enough about this to make a difference because nobody else will. They just won't. And even if we do nothing but give somebody in upper nursing administration the data, that will be a first step. You know, maybe you can't go around and start every IV. You can't necessarily you know, give education to every single nurse in the hospital every day, but we have to start doing something about this. Evaluating new technology. Uh, we have a lot of discussions about ultrasound. Well, you can't, you can't get every nurse in the hospital to be able to use ultrasound. Now, I agree with you. It's a, a totally impossible task, probably. But maybe you get one or two people on the floor and train them to use it for peripheral IVs. And the ultrasound companies will be lovely to help you because they'll sell more ultrasounds. So there's got to be a way to start to bridge this gap from for these patient standpoint, from the economic standpoint, and just from the, the you know, sustainability of our practice. I mean, maybe we'll go along for a while just being the central line people, but I think ultimately we're you know, leaving a big opportunity to make a big difference for people on the table. And I don't think very many other people will care about that but us. So that's my passionate call to action speech. And uh, when I'm in AVA, you know, uh, I'm going to have a lot of vascular access specialists there. So I would appreciate any input you have to me about how this went over. And, uh, you know, I hope that we can have some dialogue about it. If you have any ideas about, you know, that I haven't talked about, and uh, I would love to have some more dialogue about it. So thank you.